Hello and welcome to DM It All. This video is part 2 of our Dragonland series, so watch part 1 if you haven't already. As always, if you want to skip the spoilers and jump ahead to our final thoughts, move to the timestamp shown here. While Dragons of Despair was originally written by Dragonlands creator Tracy Hickman, Dragons of Flame was instead written by Douglas Niles. Niles has an accomplished D&D career of his own, and also participated in the creation of the Dragonlands universe. Niles was originally introduced to D&D through Gary Gygax's daughter, Heidi. He was her high school English teacher, and she had to leave school early one day because of a People magazine interview. After learning more about Heidi's dad and his game, Niles began playing it on his own. He eventually applied for a position as a game designer with TSR in 1979. Nowadays, Niles is probably known more for his novels, as he was the original writer of the Forgotten Realms books and exclusively wrote fantasy fiction after leaving TSR in 1990. But Niles also wrote some beloved modules during his time as a game designer, Horror on the Hill and Cult of the Reptile God. Unfortunately though, Dragons of Flame is nowhere near his best work. The first major change from the last book is that the sequel does away with the event system. Instead, Dragons of Flame introduces a new concept called NPC Capsules. These are essentially text blurbs describing certain NPCs and their history. These seem like typical NPC stat blocks and descriptions, but any NPC introduced with a capsule must survive no matter how the events play out. There are up to seven in this module, including the main bosses of the adventure. The players are not to have any effect on these characters until their intended finales, pre-written by the Dragonlance writers. If these NPC capsule characters somehow do die, the DM is recommended to give these NPCs a quote-unquote obscure death. It's something akin to a film or TV show, where everyone claims a person died even though a body was never found, so the audience knows they'll be back soon. Because we all know in fiction, if an important character falls off of a waterfall, they generally survive. The DM is therefore recommended to come up with creative ways for these guys to return from their apparent deaths. If the player character should fall, Dragons of Flame advises the DM to give them obscure deaths too, if they are playing characters from the novels. So literally no one important, not even the heroes, are allowed to die unless the module commands it. If you'll recall, Dragons of Despair ended with the party witnessing the destruction of the Tree City Solace from afar. The party starts Dragons of Flame by heading toward that town. While doing so, they walk through the other barbarian villages that were near Kyushu. These villages are now destroyed as well. To show how little control the players have over the events of this module, the party will encounter a blind old man dying from severe burns and bruises. He explains that Draconians torched the village and captured many of its inhabitants. The old man then dies in the party's arms. And he does die, no matter what the party does. Newfound healing magic be damned. To be fair, the party does get to heal other dying NPCs when they pop up later on. But it's funny that the module demands that this unimportant old man bites the dust no matter what. The world map for this adventure is similar to the first module's map, except it highlights the southern elflands more. The additions don't really matter though, as there's almost zero detail given to most of the land. It's therefore up to the random encounter section and DM imagination to add any flavor to most locales. Even plot locations have little to them outside of what is necessary for the story. This includes the barbarian villages and the party's next stop, Solace. The party can choose to go to Solace willingly, or they can try to journey through the conquered dragonlands. But regardless of their choice, they will likely end up in Solace because journeying through the Conquered Lands will have the party eventually run into two red dragons on the world map. The Draconians riding these creatures will demand the party surrender so they can be sent to Solace as slaves. Refusal means a fight to the death with these dragons in a wide open plain. To give you an idea of how powerful Dragon Breath is, it deals damage equal to the dragon's current health. The thief, cleric, and magic user included in the book would get one shot by these guys even if they made their saving throws for half damage. So, RIP non-capsule party members. For the non-dungeon portion of this module, locations don't get descriptions as much as they get detailed bullet points for a linear plot progression. The party goes from paragraph to paragraph, 
as if this was an actual novel that they were reading. So thanks to the linear nature of the story, the next major event will inevitably take place in Solace. The town has been reduced to a bunch of huts on the ground, surrounded by the wreckage of the former tree village. Solace is also teeming with Kapak Draconians, a beefier set of Draconians that turn to acid as they die. They also have venomous saliva that can paralyze their opponents. Despite the occupation in Solace, it is easy for the party to get around the various patrols. The party can start trouble with the guards if they wish to, but all that would do is speed them to the next scripted event. Solace's current population is mostly comprised of widows, orphans, and old people, as all the families have been taken to Pax Tharkis, a dungeon name that is almost an anagram of Zaxaroth. The able-bodied men have been forced to work in Pax Tharkis mines, and their families are being held hostage there to ensure the slaves cooperate. The main place to visit in Solace is the Inn from Dragons of Despair, where the party met the Storyteller, aka the random old guy that told them to go directly to Saxaroth and skip half of the module. The barmaid, Tika Whalen, is the first appearance of the NPC capsule idea. She offers the party food and invites them to a private conversation. Tika wants to join the party and claims to be bored with the town, when in reality she wants to fight back against the Draconians. A mysterious cloaked figure will be lurking in the corner of the room during the entire conversation with Tika. Eventually, some Draconians will enter and remove the figure's cloak, revealing him to be an elf. Elves and humans stop getting along after the Cataclysm, so elves are rare outside of the Elflands. The Draconians will start bullying the elf, causing Tika to fight them with a frying pan. Whether or not the party helps her with the fight, the party will be arrested by the Draconian patrol that enters immediately afterwards. If the party doesn't join the brawl, they'll still be arrested for crimes against Zaxaroth. How the Draconians know and prove this is anyone's guess. The patrol is led by Fumaster Toad, who was the commander in charge of the very first Hobgoblin encounter from Dragons of Despair. Not only did he apparently survive that first encounter, but he is now another important NPC that has to live no matter what. And we don't mean just this encounter, he survives the entire module. Fumaster Toad doesn't show up again until the 12th installment of the series too. By that point, the party will likely have forgotten who this bozo even is. But anyway, the party will get captured, and there is really nothing they can do to stop it, unless they can defeat the 48 Draconians swarming them. Having the players get captured no matter what they do is really one of the defining features of a railroady adventure. If it wasn't bad enough to be forced to lose, the party will now have no choice but to be taken where the DM wants them to go. In this case, the party will be tossed into wheeled cages owned by a slave caravan heading towards Pax Tharkis. The cloaked elf from the bar is also captured, as he is another important NPC named Gilthanus. Tika and Gilthanus are both pre-generated characters that players can control, but they don't become playable until set points in the story, kind of like Goldmoon in the first module, but to a more egregious degree. Tika becomes playable after the frying pan fight, but the person waiting to play Gilthanus will have to wait until the party heads to Pax Tharkis halfway through the module. NPC Gilthanus will advise the party not to formulate any escape plans, as their chances will be much better if they wait a bit which means they should wait until there's a plot-mandated escape sequence. So not only does the party have no say in getting captured, but they're also discouraged from finding a way out of it on their own. Not to mention that the only purpose behind this capture is to push the party into the Elflands, which was something that could have been done via a conversation in Solace. At the very least, the capture could have been optional, like the Swamp Ambush from the first module. As the caravan heads to Pax Tharkis, Gilthanus will tell the party about the history of their destination. Pax Tharkis was built by both elves and dwarves on the border between their lands, back when the two races got along. The story will be interrupted, however, when Gilthanus' elf buddies finally arrive to attack the Draconian captors. The party will be freed during the commotion and join the fight. Afterwards, the elves will ask the player characters to follow them which they should do because going anywhere without an escort will have the party run into endless draconian forces. The game also becomes unwinnable if the party doesn't help the elves relatively soon. 
dally too long, and the elves will carry out their own rescue of Pax Tharkis, drastically weakening their main forces. The Draconians will then invade the elf lands and slaughter the elves. Theoretically, the heroes could still free Pax Tharkis if they reach it from here, but it's more likely the heroes will die before that happens, since they'll have to fight Draconian army after Draconian army every hour. The gods even send a prophetic dream to the party's clerics to make this point super obvious. Following the elves, the player characters will be escorted to the elf capital of Qualanost, a small city largely made of slender quartz buildings. Gilthanus' father is the leader of the elves, and is referred to as the Speaker. Upon seeing his father, Gilthanus will immediately tell the Speaker how he got separated from his group of elf rebels. He relays that he was knocked unconscious during a fight with Draconians, and awoke to find Solace destroyed. His elf companions were tied to stakes at the town square, and burned alive by dragonfire on Lord Verminard's command. Gilthanus will introduce his father to the party, and mention any cleric spells the party displayed while with Gilthanus. The speaker will be so impressed that he'll introduce the party to his daughter, another important NPC named Lorana. Lorana is mostly here to act like a spoiled brat and to get kidnapped later in the night by Fumaster Toad. You know, like a proper princess. As you can guess, there is nothing the party can do to stop this event. Eventually, the speaker will hold a gathering and explain that the elves need to leave the Qualanesti elflands before they get invaded. Gilthanus will explain that his original mission was to free the women and children of Pax Tharkis so the men could stage a revolt. The hope was that the slaves escaping into the mountains would distract the dragon army long enough for the elves to venture west. The speaker will then ask the party to help Gilthanus with a second attempt at this plan. The next day, the party will head to Sla Mori, a secret elf path that leads to Pax Tharkis. Along the way, they will meet Eben Shatterstone, another NPC capsule. He helps the party during a draconian ambush, or at least that's what it looks like he does. Unbeknownst to the players, the ambush was staged and Eben is a spy trying to infiltrate the party. But if the party suspects him of foul play, they can't even slay him, because he needs to betray the party in the next module in another very scripted event. This is extra obnoxious because Eben doesn't contribute much in the novel character-wise, outside of sowing paranoia within the party. The module could have replaced this mandatory NPC with a traitor mechanic among the existing, established NPC allies. Anyway, Gilthas will lead the party to Sla Morai, a mountain pass with a name that literally means Secret Way in Elvish. The entrance to this pass is sealed with magic that only specific words can unlock. And yes, this is very similar to that secret door from Lord of the Rings, even down to the fact that elves and dwarves work together to make it. Once inside, the party can find the burial chamber of Kith Kanan, the elf prince that built Pax Tharkis. The party can even take Kith Kanan's sword, the Worm Slayer. This is a powerful weapon against dragons, and it even starts to hum when dragons are nearby, which is funny because it ruins every surprise dragon in the modules from here on out. After getting the sword, the party has to fight their way through Kith Kanan's zombie royal guard. And if the players look around, they'll also find a massive hoard of gold that's useless because again, gold is useless in this realm. Afterwards, it's onward to Pax Tharkis. Thankfully, the Pax Tharkis dungeon is a step up from the super linear first half of the module. Things will become more scripted again as the module approaches its finale, but for now, the party can explore whatever rooms they want. One element the party should look out for is the bell and chain system in two key areas, that serves as an alarm for the fortress. The party should make sure the Draconians don't get to pull these, or else they'll face double the amount of enemies at double the random encounter rate. The women prisoners of Pax Tharkis are held pretty close to the entrance. After meeting with them, the party will learn that the children are kept under the watchful eye of a dragon named Flamestrike. Flamestrike is a crazed, elderly, and half-blind red dragon that thinks the human children in her care are her own long-lost deceased babies. The imprisoned women visit the men and children while dressed in heavy robes in order to bring them food. If the party doesn't think of it, the women will suggest that the player characters wear these robes and pretend that they are the female servants. This is the best way to get around the draconian guards. Near the women's cells, the party can run into some uh, gully dwarves launching themselves with a makeshift catapult in their free time. These dwarves will help the party if they offer random goodies, even if it's just baubles that might serve as toys. However, they'll be more willing to take greater risks if the party saves a gully dwarf prisoner named Sestun. 
Seston was Toad's servant, but wound up betraying his master when the slave caravan was attacked by elves. He's actually the one responsible for opening the cages and freeing the party. The module notes that Seston is a creature of high courage and spirit, even as the module continues to regard gully dwarves as the living equivalent of smelly garbage. If the party reaches Flamestrike's quarters, they can quietly sneak out the children as she sleeps. She'll eventually awaken as the children are almost out and attack the party with her aged teeth and ragged claws. She avoids using her dragon breath around the children, which makes this encounter a bit easier. But Flamestrike is also another unkillable NPC, so the party should flee, taking advantage of her inability to fit through the dungeon's narrow corridors. The module assumes that the alarms will be triggered by this time, so the finale turns into a mad dash to reach the mines. If the party brings the women and children, the male slaves will easily overthrow their captors now that they know their families are safe. This sets up the epilogue as Flamestrike follows the party, seeking to save her quote-unquote children. At the same time, Verminard will appear on top of a different red dragon, threatening to kill all the women and children because of the slave revolt. The crazed Flamestrike will then start fighting Verminard in order to defend her beloved offspring. This gives the party a chance to escape into the mountains. The epilogue curiously closes without a final boss fight in this module. Sure, the party could start some beef with Verminard by fighting him in his chamber beforehand, but it won't do anything besides make them feel better about themselves. He'll face an obscure death and then come back for this finale and for the next module. The whole situation isn't even accurate to the books either, since the Dragonlance crew does kill Verminard in the first novel, but the modules deviate from this canon, having him affect the plot of the next two modules. This alternate history makes the restrictive nature of this storyline even more unpleasant since it negates one of the possible excuses for it, because one could argue that the point of these modules is to accurately portray the events of the books, and that's not really possible to do with too much player input on the plot. But the module's own plot diverges from the books while simultaneously denying players the ability to do the same. The changes to Verminard and the Traitor might be due to the fact that the two following modules, Dragons of Hope and Dragons of Desolation, ended up being cut from the Dragonlance novels. They would not be adapted as books until over a decade later, when Weiss and Hickman revisited this era of the franchise. With that material removed from Dragons of Autumn Twilight, the decision at the time might have been to have the writers quickly wrap up the plot threads within Pax Tharkis instead. Whatever the reason for this disparity, it ironically means the novel is staged more like a D&D adventure than the actual D&D modules. Things come to a head when the villains meet the heroes, instead of episodic encounters typical of other media. We should note that it is tough developing ongoing villains in D&D, since the players always have the possibility to kill them. But that's why D&D villains have to be developed in other ways. We often have to learn about the bad guy through the aftermath of his actions, and through other NPCs. Of course, you can have reoccurring villains that taunt the players, provided these bad guys are given an escape route. Giving the villain access to a teleport spell might be viewed as a cop-out, but it's still within the rules. However, if the players manage to outsmart a fleeing foe, it's good game sense that they should be allowed to win. This not only allows the stories to change and adapt based on player actions, but rewards the players for their well-earned victories. A DM should generally be prepared for any NPC to die if they show up to interact with the party, but NPC capsules contradict this mentality, and therefore limit player influence. The capsules are probably another result of these modules being written at the same time as the novels. It wasn't clear how long certain characters would stick around or how important they would become. If the module allowed for the removal of too many characters, the future plots could become unrecognizable but they mostly bring this problem on themselves by needlessly entwining NPCs more fully with the narrative than they did in Dragons of Despair. Tika, for example, mostly exists in this book to start a brawl with the Draconians, when the Draconians could have just gone after the party directly. The heroes are the only able-bodied people in Solace not working in the mines, after all. And Lorana is the worst example. If you already forgot who she was, she was the kidnapped elf princess from the Elfland. She will likely be freed during the raid on Pax Tharkis and join the party. 
The purpose of her forced kidnapping was likely to ensure her inclusion in the next adventure, but her role in the next two modules is so insignificant that the DM in those books is recommended to constantly remind the party that, hey, she exists. She eventually becomes playable down the line, but anyone who wants to play Lorana in a Dragonlance campaign will homebrew her into the first module, rather than wait until, oh, module 6. Which is another reason why Goldmoon, Lorana, and all these characters shouldn't have been mandatory, since fans who really wanted to play them could have naturally expanded their roles on their own anyway. The module is not completely irredeemable, since Pax Tharkis has some flavor in its concept. The idea of elves and dwarves being friends before the modern era is not unique in fantasy, but nevertheless that history adds some intrigue to the dungeon surroundings, and the 3D Pax Tharkis map is the greatest part of this package. We will give the module credit for creating an oppressive atmosphere too. The party will definitely feel the pressure of a massive dragon army at their backs with very few places left to hide. It's just a shame that this situation is set up to force the players' hands, rather than encourage them to do some dynamic guerrilla warfare. Some could argue that dungeon masters could always ignore the forest plot elements and create their own version of the narrative. D&D is a very open and customizable game after all, but when the majority of the module is used to explain a very specific plot, its value as a source book is weakened. We learn very little about Solace and the Elflands, and even less about the world surrounding them. The central premise should have been about traveling in a conquered land, but it's mostly about the party being captured, freed, and sent to a dungeon. A more sandbox approach would have made this adventure more useful for people in a custom Dragonlance campaign, or even in a completely custom setting. Dragonlance was not the first D&D adventure to be more focused on plot, nor was it the first one to form a single, long narrative. But it was the most ambitious attempt at those ideas for the time. And neither is Dragonlance the worst example of railroading in D&D by a long shot. But it is one of the most infamous examples due to the franchise's long history and wide impact. Everyone's preferences in D&D are different, so some people might defend Dragons of Flame and more linear adventures in general. And there definitely was a fervent demand for more plot-heavy adventures, or else they wouldn't have become the norm. But railroading is typically considered a bad attribute because of the fact that D&D is still fundamentally a game focused around its players. Your friends should be rewarded for paying attention and making good decisions. And if player choices don't matter, they'll naturally become less inventive as well as less engaged. Obscure in player deaths can be just as ridiculous, as no threat of death means no sense of risk, much less challenge. We grow attached to these characters as we play them, because we want them to survive and prosper. Without death, the hard decisions one makes in a campaign become that much easier. Lastly, the Dungeon Master's goal should always be to make sure everyone is having fun, and one of the worst ways to do that is to just relentlessly read stuff at the players and nullify the impact of their decisions. It's clear why the Dragonlance novels are more fondly remembered than the modules, and it's partly because TSR didn't really understand what the purpose of these adventures should have been. Novel readers would largely know the story beats already, and new players would primarily be looking for a good adventure. The solution shouldn't have been to force the players down a variation of the book's narrative. Instead, it should have been to allow the players to craft their own version of the narrative. A common accusation of railroad adventures is that the module creator feels more like a frustrated fantasy novelist rather than someone interested in writing an interactive adventure. And in the case of Dragons of Flame, the players are better served reading the novel than playing an imitation of it. Thank you for listening to DM It All. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, comment down below with your thoughts. If you're a Dragonlance fan, what do you think of these modules? Did you ever consider running them yourself? And for people unfamiliar with the franchise, what do you think of this series and its history? And if you're an NES fan, you can always check out our playthroughs of the Dragonlance video games on our other channel, RPG Crits, where we ironically enjoyed this module's game more than the previous one. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you all next session. Welcome to the Elven Village. The party was able to rest fully there. When they left the village, 
Gilthinus came with them. With my elven spells, I can open the door into Slamori. If you really want to go, I shall guide you and open Slamori's doors. I, I like how <laughs> this this narration changes between First person, that guy, yeah, the elf yeah. talking, and a narrator. Yeah. The party accepted the arrangement. Yes. I'll take you. The party accepted. The party accepted the arrangement, and they're like, "What are you talking? We didn't say that at all." <laughs> Once again, accompanied by Gilthan. 